Good morning. Well, for me, it's morning. It's about 6 a.m. I've been up for a couple of hours thinking about what to tell you guys next. I actually went to sleep really early last night. Um, I got to see Bette Midler in the Continental Baths like 1972 or 73. I think I was 13, 14 years old. Um, I had left home really early because my mother was schizophrenic and my life was pretty much in danger. That's a whole other story. Um, so my story at the Continental Bath starts a little ways back. I was going to high school performing arts and a friend of mine worked at the Metropolitan Opera House and I have a little story about that posted up here, how we all dropped acid at 14 and <laughs> went on stage 13, 14. And he took magic classes at the YMCA and uh, I went to one of his magic classes just to hang out and get out of, away from my home, with my mom. And uh, at the Y, I went downstairs and I went to the bathroom. Now this, this has a couple of adult related themes in here, so if you're sensitive to this material, shut it off right now. I went to the bathroom as a 14, 13, 14 year old and uh, I was shy so I went into one of the stalls and there was something on the side called a glory hole. Well, I didn't know what that was. So uh, I sat down to pee <laughs> like any good respectable man would. And all of a sudden, you know, that comes out of a glory hole and I freak out like, oh my God. I get out of there, I run out of the bathroom. I run out of the YMCA, I run into Central Park and wouldn't I know it that I'm in a cruising area in Central Park and uh, I hide underneath this bridge and this guy comes up behind me and touches me on the shoulder and I wasn't really out. I knew I was gay but I wasn't sure it was going. And I was like, well, he goes, here's the key to my room. I'm staying at the YMCA. Just show this to the guard. You can go upstairs and I'll meet you up there and we'll fool around. So I was like, all right. You know, I, I, I knew I wasn't quite out, but I knew I was. I wanted to have an experience, so on, whatever. Go up there, we fool around. Afterwards, the guilt trip comes in and I start crying. It's like, you know, I don't want to be gay. I don't want to, you know, wear a pocketbook and, you know, have to put on a dress because I didn't know I was a kid. I just knew stereotype of what gay was. So he said, and I told him, oh, I live at home and my mother's going to kill me. He said to me, look, don't worry. If you ever have any problems, you can always come and talk to me and I'll help you, you know, deal stuff, you know, get through stuff. Now, I was 13 or 14 years old, but I, I was tall. I'm 6'4". I used to lie and tell people I was 18 and 19 and they believed it. That's how I got into all these clubs and to all these places. So I told this guy I was 18 or 19 years old. He probably raised a half of an eyebrow, thought, okay, you know, you're not 14. So he said, if you have any problems, just, just come to me. So the next day I uh, managed to get into the Y and I, there's a knock on his door. He opens the door and I'm standing there with my suitcase. And, he, and he's like, more for, like, what are you doing? And I said, well, if you told me if there's any problems, I can always come to you and hi, I'm here and I'm moving in. The guy's like, what? I said, please don't let me go home. My mother's crazy and she hurts me and beats me and all kinds of stuff. And All right, all right, come in, come on, we'll work it out. So what he wound, we wound up doing, I lived at the McBurney Y on 63rd Street with this guy, Steve. And um, he, we used to pay the maid $20 a week to keep her mouth shut because two men were not allowed in rooms because they didn't want any homosexuals at the Young Man's Christian Association, the YMCA. But that place was like a bathhouse, let me tell you. It was notoriously gay and they had public, you know, each floor had showers and when the water hit the floor, like 10 guys would come to look and see who's, who's the new guy in the shower, checking out the goods. So we lived there for about three or four weeks and um, Steve decided he was gonna get an apartment because the YMCA wasn't working out and we were gonna get thrown out and literally be on the street. He got an apartment on 71st Street in Central Park West. And we had no furniture and no money. Steve was about 22 years old or something like that, or 24 years old, and I told him I was 18. Uh, every night he would go out to work. 
And he would leave around eight or nine o'clock and come home about four o'clock in the morning. And I, he wouldn't tell me where he worked. Uh, by the way, Steve had a yellow, canary yellow dress with canary yellow stockings, canary yellow shoes, and a pocketbook hanging in the closet. And I was like, whose is that? He goes, oh, that's my sister's when she comes to visit me in New York. Well, Steve was doing drag, and I didn't know that. But, you know, I didn't know any of the stuff that guys dressed up as a woman at, you know, 14 years old. All I knew is I had a pl safe place to stay and food, and I was away from my terrible mother situation in Brooklyn. So, Steve, um, we didn't have furniture, we didn't even have a bed. So we had this, Steve had this brilliant idea where we were gonna steal the mattress from the YMCA. And we were on the ninth floor. So Steve tied the mattress to my back with some rope. About one o'clock in the morning, we looked out in the hallway to see if anybody was there. There was nobody there. And I climbed down nine flights of stairs at the YMCA with a mattress on my back and walked up Broadway from 60, was it 68th Street to 71st Street. Well, I'll tell you, I remember a car, there I am with a mattress on my back walking up Broadway and a car of guys from New Jersey pull up, hey baby, how much to get laid? You got the mattress on your back. It, w it, was, it, was, it was just like a horror show. I um, uh, actually wound up getting really sick. I wound up getting pneumonia because it was like in the winter time. It was, uh, I think, October. It was November, actually, because that's when Bette Midler played, November 26th, 27th or something like that. So it's November. It was freezing cold, and I was soaking wet. Anyway, we get this apartment, and we kind of settle in, and I think, whew, I'm safe. You know, nobody's going to hurt me. And Steve kept going to work at night, and I couldn't understand. So one night I followed him. And uh, I waited for the elevator door to close in the hallway. I was peeking out of the hallway door and I ran down the, the, uh, the stairs, stairwell. He came out of the lobby, I looked, and I paced him, you know, like a half a block away. He went up to Broadway on, uh, we were on 71st between Broadway and West End. And uh, he went up to Broadway, made a turn, and I paced and I followed him. And he went up to 74th Street. There was a giant hotel called the Ansonia Hotel. It's still there. And the Ansonia was known, there were a lot of opera singers in there. There are a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, just crazy, insane, creative people. This was the hotel where these people stayed. It was a pre-war building. There were, you know, giant ceilings and ornate, you know, uh, uh, plaster, you know, uh, 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 moldings and stuff like that. It was a turn of the century hotel and it, it survived and it was pretty amazing. On 74th Street, the side of the hotel, down in the basement, there was a bathhouse. I didn't know what a bathhouse was. Uh, and a bathhouse is a place where gay men would go and obviously fool around, but it was more than just a horror house. It was kind of like this fantasy land where you would go and there were no clocks and you'd have entertainment and dinner. You could actually eat food. They had a, 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 a a uh, place where they served food and all that kind of stuff and uh, shows and of course the rooms where you fool around. So Steve walks into this unmarked doorway and I wait a couple of seconds and I kind of go up and I open the doorway a little bit and there's a outer and inner vestibule and it says uh, Continental Baths private membership or something like that, men only. And I thought, oh, well, what is this? And I went open the door, the inner door, and there's a security, there's a place where you pay, and there's a security guard standing there, and I noticed people were coming in and out, showing them a little, a little pass, you know, an in and out pass. <clears throat> so I went back outside, and I opened up my shirt <clears throat> all the way down to my navel, uh, you know, I had roll brush hair and a little puka shell necklace, you know, and uh, I thought, well, I'm going to get in here, even if I have to, you know, show my tits or something like that. So I woke up to the security guard, he goes, hey, where are you going? I said, oh, I left my pass downstairs, I just had to run out to my car. He goes, wait a minute, you didn't come in. And I batted my eyelashes and said, yes, I did, you know, you know, I, well, my things are downstairs, you know, uh, you can't, you know, keep me from coming in. And he grabbed, he grabbed my ass and said, well, see you later. And I'm like, yeah, sure, see you later. Opened the door and there was a narrow hallway. Everything was painted like black shiny black lacquer, you know, and there was a 
staircase that went downstairs with a pin spot. And you open the door and you can feel the humidity and smell the chlorine and I could hear water falling. And I went down the stairs, I made the little L turn and it was like, I, I tell people it's like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz because if you've never been in a place like this, all of a sudden the world went from black and white to color. I'm descending the stairs and over on the left hand side there's a giant Olympic swimming pool with, um, with fountains going into it. If you ever saw the movie The Ritz, that's what they did the Continental Baths about, but the Continental Baths was way better than the Ritz movies set. You know, uh, there were these fountains and there was these guys swimming and playing in the pool, horsing around um, off to the left wall. Um, there was a door that kept opening and it looked like a fire breathing dragon because there were billows of smoke that came out, which was the steam room where people would go in and get steam or fool around in there. Uh, at, on the right hand side there was a, a black lacquer disco dance floor with mirrors all around because that was the, the age of chrome and mirrors and um, uh, a Bose sound system and I heard bass for the first time. I mean you got to remember clubs didn't have big sound systems like they do now so this was like the first one of the early big disco sound system with a DJ playing live. There was a stage to one side and then over in the distance there was a uh, um, like a short order, what would you call it? Like a, 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 a not like a diner, but you know, like a, a, a diner counter, you know, and uh, they would, you can get grilled cheese sandwiches and pot roast and eggs for breakfast. You would check into this place, I think it was $10 or $12 to stay for 24 hours, and you had in and out privileges. So a lot of gay guys traveling from city to city, there were bathhouses all across America. Instead of paying for a hotel room, you could go to one of these bathhouses, pay 10 or $12, have a, a small cubicle room to sleep in, also fool around in, but you had in and out privileges. So if you're on a business trip or you just wanted to see New York or San Francisco or Miami or some Pittsburgh, you can go to the bathhouse, get laid, but also have a cheap place to stay that was cheaper than hotels and a place to probably eat too. I mean, you paid for the food. These places were kept very clean and uh, th there were there were white wicker chairs, the kind that uh, Morticia would sit in in the Adams family, and there were fake palm trees, and it was a whole fantasy trip. <clears throat> and I noticed off in the corner, Steve was at the... Uh, um, counter, the guy I was had, had the place with, and he was cooking, getting ready to cook food, and I thought, oh boy, if he sees me here, I'm going to be in trouble. Off to the side, there was a doorway that led into darkness. Well, like a snake, I slid along the side walls, you know, not being noticed, and I managed to get past Steve and go into the back. Uh, it, there, there may have been 50 rooms of guys, you know, in there, and they were obviously fooling around. The doors were open, some of them and guys were laying there with, the, with towels and the light was really dim, waiting for somebody to come in, close the door and fool around. It was this, this, this whole fantasy trip. And one of the famous people that were in there was Rudolf Nureyev. And I very clearly remember, he was an exhibitionist, he had the door open and some guy was on top of him and three or four guys were standing in the doorway watching him have sex. Um, <clears throat> he was apparently a, a, a regular there and he was an exhibitionist and liked to have everybody watch what he was doing. I wandered around back there and uh, um, uh, went into a room and I think I probably fooled around with somebody. I came out hours, hours later because I was afraid that Steve was going to kill me. And uh, I come out and I forget that Steve's there. I'm like, my mind is elsewhere. And he screams, what are you doing here? He's behind the counter. And he takes a frying pan and throws it at, get out of here, you shouldn't be here. You know, you, you know, I don't want you in a place like this. And throws the frying pan and it slides across the, um, it slides across the lacquer floor and winds up in the swimming pool and all these queens start screaming, oh my God, he's crazy. There's gonna be a, a, a lover's quarrel or something like that. You know, they just thought something terrible was gonna happen. Uh, buddy, come on, baby, can I do this? My dog's talking and wants to be in the video. Um, so he said, I want you to sit at this counter. I don't want you to go anywhere. I said, okay, I'll sit here. And there was a, um, there was a, uh, they were setting the stage up for something. And I said, what's going on? He goes, there's gonna be a show. 
And I said, oh, okay, can I go and see the show? And um, I promised to just sit there and not wander around. And he said, sure. So they set up all the chairs, <clears throat> and I sat a couple of rows back. And here were, I was dressed. There were guys in towels, and uh, uh, people were coming in from the street. They allowed couples to come in, uh, you know, just guys, girls to come in on the weekend for these, for these bathhouse shows. And then um, everybody's sitting there, show starts, and they announce, ladies and gentlemen, there's a new artist. She's brand new. Her name is Bette Midler. And I was like, wow, okay, Bette Midler. And she put on a fantastic show, and when she announced the band, she said, I'd like to announce my drummer, my, my bass player, and this is my piano player, Barry Manlow. And he was unknown playing piano for Bette. Now, if you search on YouTube, you'll definitely see that there are some videos from that show on the internet. And uh, she did a great show, everybody loved her. Afterwards, um, she... Uh, um, uh, they cleared all the, the chairs and the, 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 the non-patrons that were staying there uh, left, you know, and Bette came out and there were little beanbag chairs around the sides of the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the dance floor, the disco, and all these queens were sitting there in towels and Bette came out and like, oh my god, it's Bette, oh, we love you. She wasn't famous, but they, she's a little local celebrity and all the guys loved her. And, I remember her, we were all sitting around and she's there and she's going, well, I don't know what to do, you know, should I continue taking singing lessons or should I spend my money on a therapist and all the queens, oh, you have to keep singing, you're fabulous. And uh, Bette Midler became Bette Midler. Um, there were a couple of other famous people that played there. Um, Patti LaBelle played there with the Bluebells, um, which was pretty amazing. Uh, Frida Payne and um, I have to look at my... I actually have to look at my phone to see who the other person was. Um, Melba Moore. <laughs> so these bathhouse shows were pretty amazing. Um, Steve Ostrow, O-S-T-R-O-W, you could look him, Google him. He was the owner of the Continental Baths and owned a chain of them, uh, several across America. Uh, later on, we went to, went to go up to his, his apartment. Uh, I think he was on Fifth Avenue or something like that. Uh, but it was quite a time in New York City when, um, when bathhouses were pretty prevalent. This is well before, this is 10 years before AIDS, you know, so uh, these were socially accepted places. If you were gay, because you were in the closet, uh, you would have to go to gay bars to meet guys or gay restaurants to sit across from your boyfriend and not have somebody throw something at you or spit on you. And um, if you wanted to go fool around and you were single, these bathhouses were places where there were no windows and no clocks. And they were these fantasy places with palm trees and falling waterfalls and, uh, you know, guys walking around in towels, you know, eye candy, where you can go and be yourself. Because if you went to your straight friends bars and you were effeminate or you looked at another guy, you could seriously get hurt. I mean, really get a bad beating. So kids are lucky now, whether you're straight, gay, you know, transgender, it's accepted. But back then it was a shameful, horrible life to live. You, you were always in fear that if somebody found out you were gay, you, you could literally lose your job. Uh, uh, Landlords would throw you out on the street, and God forbid if your family ever knew, they would disown you. There were so many kids that were disowned by their family that were homeless, living on the street down at the piers at the end of Christopher Street in New York um, because their families, good kids, uh, their families just, you know, you're gay, you're, you're a faggot, you're a queer, get out of my house. And um, many of them didn't make it in the street. New York City was very rough at that time. Anyway, um, that's my Continental Bath story with Bette Midler, uh, uh, Barry Manlow, and Rudolf Nureyev. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much again for listening to my stories. Uh, I'm glad I got to experience all these things in New York, and I'm so glad I'm sharing these with you. Uh, it would be um, great if you could subscribe and uh, hit that little button and share this with your friends. Lots more stories to come. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, for listening in. Bye.